So we say that a boundary value problem, or an initial value problem, or an initial value boundary problem is well posed if and only if a solution exists. So this is the existence criterion. The solution needs to be unique. So this is the uniqueness criterion. And the solution depends continuously on the boundary or initial value data. And this is called stability. So what we saw in the last video was that the Laplace problem fails to be, or the Cauchy problem for the Laplace equation, fails to be well posed because it fails to be stable. So <coughs> by contrast, um, consider the uh, Cauchy problem for the heat equation. So um, suppose we let u be a solution for the Cauchy problem for the heat equation um, with the initial condition uh, ux0 being given by some function phi of x and let um, v be a solution for the initial condition vx0 equals psi of x. Um, and let's choose these initial conditions to be close to each other. So we'll say that let's restrict um, phi minus psi to be less than epsilon. So epsilon is some small number or, or whatever. And the key point here is that this is true for all x. So it's a uniform bound, a uniform estimate over, over the entire real line. OK, so let's define w to be the difference between these two, u minus v. Then um, w is also going to be a solution because the, uh, but it's going to be a PDE, sorry, w is going to be a solution for the PDE because the PDE is linear, and we've just taken a linear combination of solutions, uh, linear and homogeneous, I should say. Um, but it's going to have different initial values. It's going to be um, Uh, the initial conditions for W are just going to be the difference of the two initial conditions uh, that we've got before. So <clears throat> now that means that the um, uh, <clears throat> the magnitude of W is is bounded. Okay, by by the same epsilon. So now. Let's look at what this implies about um, our solution. Oh, sorry, I, I shouldn't have written that. Let me go back and make a correction here. So w of x0 is bounded by epsilon. And, and we'll see that that forces it to be bounded by epsilon everywhere. OK, and so that's what we're going to do right now we're going to show so here's a preview of coming attractions that it has to be um, bounded by epsilon for all forward time as well okay so let's see so if we look at w well we have um, the explicit well relatively speaking explicit solution for the Cauchy problem for the heat equation given by the integration against the heat kernel. So this is uh, phi y minus psi y. There's our w in parentheses. And then we are taking the convolution of it against the heat kernel. So there's our heat kernel. OK. So now um, for any value of t, Let's see what we've got here. So on the left side, we've got, uh, 
let's, uh, and now I'm going to look at this in terms of magnitude or absolute value. So I'm going to take the absolute value of each side. So the absolute value of w is the absolute value of v minus c. And then on the right hand side, I have the absolute value of this integral. And it's an important fact, one of the most commonly used estimates in analysis, that the absolute value of an integral is less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value. Um, this is the infinite dimensional version of something you may know as the triangle inequality, which says that x plus y in absolute value is bounded by x absolute value of x plus absolute value of y, and it works just as well for vectors. And if you have an infinite number of things to add up, it still works as long as it converges. And even in the continuous case, it still works, and then you have this, this one that I just used right here. So that is that the integral, absolute value of the integral of f is bounded by integral of absolute value of f. Very handy. OK, so now let's see. Looking at the um, integrand here, I can take this uh, absolute value of um, the product and split it into the product of absolute values, like so. Um, and then we know that uh, this one here is going to be bounded by epsilon by our original choice. So I can say that this is uh, strictly less than epsilon integral from minus infinity to infinity of gx minus yt dy. Um, uh, well, technically speaking, that's in absolute values, but I can actually remove them because um, I, I know that the heat kernel is um, non-negative. Actually, it's strictly positive. And then from the homework, um, you saw that this integral here is actually equal to 1 for any time t. So reading from left to right, then, we have that um, we've, we've discovered Oh, important typo. Ah, sorry. Somehow back here, I wrote the initial conditions. That's uh, wrong. This is u minus v, not, not phi minus psi. Sorry about that. That's just, phi minus psi is just the initial conditions. We're doing it for all time right now. Sorry about that. So uh, the conclusion was, now that if we go back and we look at our um, original assumption that phi and psi are close to each other, then we get the same bound on these guys right here. So phi and psi being close implies that u and v are close. OK. Um, <clears throat> or another way of looking at the, or interpreting the same expression here is uh, we're saying that if uh, psi is everywhere within epsilon of phi, then the corresponding solution v is everywhere within epsilon of u. And so that's what we mean for the solution to depend continuously uh, on the given initial data.